I'm going to start with quite an alarming statistic. As of 2018, 93% of Americans were considered metabolically unhealthy. That sounds almost unbelievable. Now, when you factor in that being metabolically unhealthy doesn't necessarily mean that you're generally unhealthy, it makes a little more sense. Only a small percentage of people are actually metabolically, like mitochondrially healthy. Now, what does that mean? At the root of this is going to be blood sugar modulation. Now, 93% of Americans are not dealing with high blood sugar. Don't get the wrong idea. But the point is, at the very core of metabolic health and metabolic optimization, if you're looking at that, is our ability to use fuel, our ability to use glucose, or our ability to utilize lipids. This is all very important. So whether you are someone that is trying to lower your blood sugar or not, being able to understand which diet is best for blood sugar optimization is really important because it's one thing that we can safely talk about that is important for all people, whether you're dealing with insulin resistance, whether you're an athlete, whether you are someone that's just concerned, it all matters. So we're going to look at Mediterranean diet. We're going to look at keto. We're going to look at plant-based. We're going to look at paleo. We're going to look at intermittent fasting. And there's legit literature to help us understand these things. One thing that we do know is that when calories are restricted and people are eating less, blood sugar improves and metabolic health improves. But there's more to it than just caloric restriction as we're going to see. A lot of boxes could be checked if we could just adequately restrict calories, no doubt about it. But there's a bigger piece to metabolic health than meets the eye. So the first study that I wanna look at analyzes the Mediterranean diet. Now, Full disclaimer, I love the Mediterranean diet. I'm not gonna let my biases get in the way though. I'm gonna look at everything. Okay, I think the Mediterranean diet is nice because it's still moderate protein, it's high fats, but it's the good fats, high polyphenol, high fiber. If you're a research nerd like me, things really stack up in favor. Now, it isn't as high carbohydrate as people in America might think. Different regions of the Mediterranean are going to eat different amounts of carbohydrates. Some do eat more than others, but they're usually not ridiculously high glycemic. Anyhow, I digress. There was a study published in Diabetes Medicine, it looked at 901 diabetic people, and it put them on a Mediterranean diet versus a more standard controlled diet that was still relatively low glycemic. It wasn't just like a complete willy-nilly standard American diet. They did this for six years. And after six years, they found that the stronger that people were able to adhere to the Mediterranean diet, the better their postprandial glucose. Those that adhered to a Mediterranean diet had an 18 to 20% reduction in their blood sugar after eating. And they also had quite a remarkable improvement in their HbA1c, which is a lagging indicator of sort of their glucose over the last three months, their glycolated hemoglobin. Then we look at another study published in Nutrition, Metabolism, and Cardiovascular Disease. And this, again, looked at a Mediterranean diet versus a control diet. With this, they found a number of different metabolic markers improved, but for the sake of this video, HbA1c improved. We're going to talk about HbA1c a lot in this video because it's the largest sort of indicator that we can look at. Because when you look at fasting glucose or just postprandial glucose, that can be like a flash in the pan sometimes. But HbA1c looks at the bigger picture over the last few months. Now, this next study was actually a systematic review. It looked at 17 different studies that looked at different components of the Mediterranean diet. But all in all, what they found is that there was even one study that demonstrated that there was an 85% reduced risk of developing type 2 diabetes if you were adhering to a Mediterranean diet. And there were other studies that ranged from 35 to 50% reductions as well. So clearly there is some evidence suggesting a reduced risk when you're following a Mediterranean diet. But what the most important thing to note is out of all 17 studies, not a single one showed a negative impact on blood glucose they were all powerfully improving it in one way or another. Now that we've addressed Mediterranean, 
We're gonna come back to it, but I wanna touch on keto for a second. And then we'll put keto and Mediterranean head to head. So keto is where you're just depriving yourself of carbohydrates and you're allowing your body to thrive on fats. Say what you want about it, it works very well for those that have done it, I've done it, but there's also people that are opponents of it. So let's break down the literature. There was a study published in JMIR that compared keto to more of a standard kind of mildly calorically restricted diet. Now the thing I like about this study is it used a whole food keto diet because where things can get problematic is if you're doing keto and you're just like eating like fat bombs and saturated fat all day, like this actually looked at eating predominantly leafy greens, lean protein, and adding healthy fats in. So it was a good, well-crafted keto diet. They did this for 32 weeks. The keto diet after 32 weeks showed a 6.5% reduction in HbA1c. They improved their HbA1c that much, whereas the control diet was zero zilch goose egg, even though calories were similar. So there's something to be said there, but it also makes sense. Like if you're just eliminating carbohydrates or reducing them, your insulin levels are gonna be lower, your glucose is ultimately gonna be lower, and maybe things get a chance to kind of recalibrate. The other interesting thing is that 90% of the people that were following the keto diet lost 5% or more of their body weight, whereas only 29% doing the regular caloric restriction lost 5% or more of their body weight. So this could play a role too. Like if you lose weight, you're gonna have less adipokines, you're gonna have less inflammation, and that's going to impact insulin resistance. So perhaps it was the weight loss that caused the benefit. Either way, the net result was lower HbA1c. This next diet was interesting because it looked specifically at type two diabetics that were following a low carb ketogenic diet compared to a calorically restricted diet where they reduced calories by 500 calories. So they put them in a 500 calorie deficit. Now, what was particularly interesting about this is that even though they were in a caloric deficit of 500 calories, it was also a low glycemic diet. So it was keto versus calorie restricted and low glycemic carbs. So a very good diet. What they found with this is that both groups had similar improvements in their insulin, their glucose, postprandial, and fasting levels. Okay, but only the keto diet had a significant reduction in HbA1c. So only the keto showed, group showed enough of a reduction where it was significant, and the keto group lost significantly more weight. Now there's one more study published in Molecular and Cellular Biochemistry, and this was a longer term study. So this was a 56 week study to see sort of the safety and efficacy of keto for reducing blood sugar. In this case, they looked at all kinds of different metabolic markers. And every single metabolic marker, including blood sugar and HbA1c, improved with the exception of creatinine, which is a little bit of a moot point on this because it didn't elevate, it just didn't decrease to the same degree as the others, right? And it could still stay the same because it depends on protein intake, all kinds of different factors, stress, workouts, you name it. But now let's put them head to head. Let's put keto and Mediterranean side by side and see who's the clear winner there. The American Journal of Clinical Nutrition published a paper that did just this keto or versus Mediterranean, okay? And what they ultimately found is that fasting glucose, fasting insulin, and HbA1c improved in only both groups, almost exactly in both groups. What's super cool about this is it paints a nice picture. Keto reduces blood sugar by potentially like eliminating or reducing the insulin altogether. Mediterranean goes about it a different way by reductions of saturated fat, which impacts glucose, believe it or not, by increasing good cholesterol, by increasing the amount of fiber, you're going about it a different way. So before we move on to paleo and fasting and plant-based, if you're stuck here, perhaps doing a Mediterranean version of keto could work really well. Because keto works on one angle, Mediterranean works on another angle, perhaps the combination of the two puts you in a really good spot. You get the best of both worlds, the healthy fats, the healthy protein, the polyphenols, the vegetables, the fiber, all without the potential risk of carbohydrates. Now we're gonna move into fasting. Now, one thing that's really important to note before we talk too much about fasting is that fasting is a timing system, not a diet, right? So fasting can work with any kind of diet. You could do it with the standard American diet, you could do it with plant-based, you could do it with nachos, you could do it with del taco, you can do it with el pollo loco. It's just a timing system, okay? So results are gonna vary depending on what you eat during your eating window, but the big potential benefit is that you're taking a long period of time away from food, allowing like a similar effect to what you'd get with keto by reducing glucose and stabilizing things. 
The only real way you're gonna be able to see how your glucose is reacting in real time is to actually monitor your glucose. So whenever people are doing any kind of dietary change, I recommend that they monitor their glucose, whether they're sticking their finger or if you have access to a continuous glucose monitor. I put a link down below if you wanna try a continuous glucose monitor. There's a company called Cygnos. I'm on the scientific advisory board for Cygnos, so I want to make sure I disclose that, but I highly recommend it. That is a 15% off discount link to get your hands on a continuous glucose monitor and utilize Cygnos, which is really cool because it's algorithmically tailored to help teach you when you should sort of modulate your glucose. For example, if you were to go out and eat a piece of cake, you could look and see in real time your glucose going up and it would actually help you and say, hey, you need to go for a walk for X amount of time or do some squats or try to, it coaches you along the way, but then it algorithmically sort of learns what you respond to and you can log your food with it. It is extremely smart technology and really cool algorithmic research behind it. So I highly recommend it. Again, I'm on the scientific advisory board, so I've worked with them in all kinds of different capacities. And I think as far as I'm concerned, it's the best continuous glucose monitor option that is out there in the market for people that are just trying to understand their bodies. So that link is down below underneath this video in the top line of the description. You can see it right down below. So now let's unpack fasting, because this is where it gets interesting. There was a study published in Nature Medicine that was really fascinating. It divided people into three groups. One group was a fasting group. Okay. Another group was a caloric restriction group and another group was a control group. The fasting group, what they had them do is fast three days per week for 20 hours. So they would have them eat between 8 a.m. and 12 p.m. and then fast for 20 hours. So four hour eating window, 20 hour fast. And they would only do that three days per week. Now what they did is they made sure that they only consumed 30% of their calories during those hours, right? So it was a really pretty low calorie on those fasting days. But the other days they could eat normally. The other group ate 30% caloric deficit. So they ate 70% of their normal diet every day. So they were moderately restricting calories every day versus aggressively restricting for three days a week. And the third group was a standard care control group where they followed a standard sort of diabetes diet. Now, they did markers at baseline two months, six months, and 12 months, and results were pretty cool. The most significant glucose and metabolic changes were in the fasting group. Even though calories were very similar between the fasting group and the caloric restriction group. So with this, can we just take fasting to the bank all the way? Well, not all the way, because we need to look at other pieces. There was a study that was published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition that took a look at Mediterranean diet, fasting, and paleo. And this was fully comprehensive because they also added in high intensity interval training or standard continuous type training. Well, with this, what was interesting was that the group that had the biggest improvement in HbA1c was actually the Mediterranean group. They had a 0.8% reduction in HbA1c, whereas the fasting and the paleo groups had a 0.2% reduction. Now, with Mediterranean, you're eating fruits, you're eating veggies, you're eating fiber, you're eating protein. With paleo, although it's a low sugar diet, you might be eating fruit, you might be eating things, it's, eh, you're not getting as much fiber possibly. So with the Mediterranean, the fiber might really be what was driving this impact. You might be wondering why fasting didn't perform as well as Mediterranean. In this case, fasting, it wasn't really controlled what they ate during their eating window. So again, fasting is a meal timing system. So you could arguably just eat pop tarts and bologna during your eating period and you're still fasting. So the quality of your food does absolutely matter. Your cell membranes, everything's made up of the food that we eat. So if you're gonna fast, you do have to have some responsibility. This is what's kind of interesting. Just as I suggested, we could combine a keto diet and a Mediterranean diet. Could we perhaps combine intermittent fasting and Mediterranean? Because we've established that abstaining from food can allow our insulin levels to get lower and make us more glucose tolerant. But at the same time, like if you're eating garbage, it's not going to work. So perhaps you apply Mediterranean principles with intermittent fasting. Now, some of the things that can happen with intermittent fasting and keto is that if you do it for a longer period of time, sometimes you actually lose a little bit of glucose tolerance. So if your carbohydrate intake is too low, then eventually when you do add carbs, your body's gonna respond in a really aggressive way. That can scare people. And you'll notice that if you're wearing a glucose monitor and you're measuring your glucose. 
My words to the wise here are give it time. It's important to periodically give yourself carbohydrates no matter what diet you're doing so that your body still knows how to deal with them. Now the moment that we've been waiting for, where does plant-based fall into play here? Well, there was a study published in PLOS One that looked at a standard diabetes, like sort of standard of care diet compared to a more whole food vegan diet. What was really interesting here is that the vegan diet did have better reductions in HbA1c and overall glucose than the standard prescribed sort of diabetes diet. But when you reverse engineer what they were eating with the vegan diet, it was a copious amount of fiber. That is the primary benefit, if you ask me, when it comes to glucose modulation. There's two things that we can see. High levels of saturated fat do drive up glucose eventually. It can impair glucose tolerance. High saturated fat can, doesn't always will, but can increase insulin resistance. Because saturated fat in a caloric surplus especially can contribute heavily to liver fat hepatic triglycerides, just like high levels of sugar can in a caloric surplus. It's not just about the immediate fuel that's going into the bloodstream, it's how that fuel is affecting your liver fat and your visceral fat. Saturated fat can contribute to that. Say what you want, a lot of people on a vegan diet are eating low saturated fat, so their insulin resistance levels are typically lower. That's common. But if they are eating total garbage on a vegan diet, it becomes a moot point once again. But there was a study published in Experimental and Therapeutic Medicine, and it looked at type two diabetics specifically and fiber intake. They gave subjects either zero grams of additional soluble fiber, 10 grams of additional soluble fiber, or 20 grams of additional soluble fiber. That's things like chia, flax, psyllium, et cetera. Insulin levels and glucose levels improved in a dose dependent fashion with how much fiber they added in. So when you look at this particular study looking at the vegans, it made a lot of sense that their glucose levels would go down with high fiber. What I don't want to do here is say one diet is better than the other. I think that if you're vegan and plant-based, you could absolutely apply fasting to that regimen. It's a little harder to do keto with a diet like that, but you could absolutely apply plant-based and fasting. That way you're getting the benefits of fasting along with the benefits of the high fiber and whatever benefits you're looking for with a plant-based diet. Now, same thing with Mediterranean and fasting. Every single one of the diets, even paleo that we talked about, you could apply with fasting. That's what's great. And fasting has been established to have huge benefits there. But that's extreme for some people. So what about taking another look at this? What if you were plant-based and you wanted to take a more Mediterranean flair with your plant-based diet? We can stack the things that work. And if you don't wanna be plant-based, you can stack Mediterranean with paleo, right? Say, hey, I don't wanna go keto. I like the benefits of Mediterranean, but I don't like the grains. I don't like the rice, right? It's stacking the benefits. So now we're stacking the Mediterranean diet with the benefits of paleo, and we're saying, okay, I'll have sweet potatoes, I'll have yams, I'll have tubers as my carb sources, right? I'll have fruit. If this is my carb sources and I'll lean into the protein. Okay, or maybe you'll stack a little Mediterranean paleo by you'll being flexible with paleo by maybe adding a little more raw dairy in. It's not about finding the perfect diet. It's about finding the strong suits of the individual diets and building what works perfectly for you as an individual. If you try to subscribe just to a diet tribe because of the sake of diet tribe, you're gonna find yourself frustrated. So stack the benefits and do what works for you. I'll see you tomorrow.